Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our Head and Neck Anatomy series. This video will be about the craniofacial veins. And just as a side note, this is nostalgic for me because the very first video that I ever made on this channel over five years ago was on venous drainage of the head and neck. And we've come a long way here at Mental Dental in that time. But anyway, let's get started. So the great vessel that we have to talk about here is the vena cava. The aorta was what we were concerned about when talking about arteries. The vena cava is the main vessel that's returning blood to the heart. And there are actually two divisions of it. All structures above the diaphragm are going to drain to the superior vena cava up here. And all structures below the diaphragm are going to drain into the inferior vena cava down here, both of which are emptying into that right atrium. So first, let's talk about the brachiocephalic vein. And here is another masterpiece that I drew looking at the left side, this time of the venous drainage network. So brachiocephalic, once again, brachio meaning arm, cephalic referring to the neck, so it's draining the head, neck, and the upper limb. And this time, there is a brachiocephalic vein on both sides of the body, whereas for arteries, there's only one brachiocephalic artery, and that's on the right side. But the left brachiocephalic vein is longer to once again clear room for the trachea, get out of the way of the trachea, which runs here. So this time, we have two veins and one of them is longer. And one of the veins that drains into the brachiocephalic vein is the subclavian. And the subclavian vein is going to provide venous drainage of the upper limb. And it changes its name to the axillary vein as it crosses under the clavicle and over the first rib. And this is the same that was true for the subclavian artery and the axillary artery. So this time we don't have a radial and ulnar vein, we have a basilic, which refers to the medial side of the arm, and the cephalic vein, which refers to and runs up the lateral side of the arm. So once again, medial and lateral are labeled when the arms are out, the palm is facing up, so the basilic is toward the pinky finger, cephalic is toward the thumb. And then we have the median cubital vein that connects the two of them, and it's a common site for drawing blood or uh, placing an IV. And I remember A, B, C for the arm veins, A, B, C. So another thing that pours into that brachiocephalic vein is the external jugular vein out here. Like we had an external and internal carotid artery, now we have an external and internal jugular vein. And the external jugular vein is a convergence of two veins with posterior in their name, the posterior auricular and posterior division of the retromandibular vein, both of which are pouring into that external jugular vein. Posterior auricular, of course, means behind the ear. The internal jugular vein is the primary drain for the brain and the dural venous sinuses, and this one exits through the jugular foramen, hence its name. The internal jugular vein is receiving most of the blood from up here in the brain, but also getting some from the common facial vein, which is a combination of the anterior division of the retromandibular vein, as well as just the plain facial vein. And note how in my drawing, the retromandibular vein makes this upside down Y shape with the main part, and then it has an anterior and a posterior division. And this makes it just a bit easier to understand in my head because that retromandibular vein often trips students up because it's a little bit confusing. But hopefully that can make it just a little bit more simple. So the facial vein provides the majority of venous drainage of the face, and it drains once again into the internal jugular vein via that common facial vein, which we just saw in the last slide. 
So this vein is going to course diagonally across the face along with the facial artery. It takes the exact same route. Veins in the head have no valves, so blood can flow in either direction. So it has this communication with the deep facial vein, the pterygoid plexus, which is right here, the ophthalmic vein, the infraorbital vein, and the cavernous sinus. And so we'll talk about why that's important in just a little bit. The pterygoid plexus of veins earns its name because it's associated with the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. It drains the superior and inferior alveolar veins of the teeth and drains the infratemporal fossa region. Pressure from the masticatory muscles can actually help pump this blood, causing it to move because, again, there are no valves directing blood flow, and so pressure from those muscles can help to move it. The cavernous sinus is an important structure that sits lateral to the cella tersica, so there's one on either side. There are a couple important structures that pass through it, the internal carotid artery right here, and then we also have a couple of nerves, cranial nerve 3, 4, V1, V2, and 6 that pass through it. Now the nearby superior orbital fissure transmits cranial nerves 3, 4, V1, and 6. And so you only have to add the internal carotid and V2 to that collection to fill out all the things that pass through it. The reason why I talked about communication with the various veins before is because of cavernous sinus thrombosis, which can occur if infections reach this space. And you can imagine there are all these important nerves here that control eye movement, so you can get some really nasty side effects if this space becomes infected. The three main routes of infection that can reach the cavernous sinus are facial infection from a pimple, dental infection, and a scalp infection. So I'll show you on this slide, here we have the cavernous sinus that we were just looking at, and I'll draw in red the different infection routes that it can take. Say if there was a pimple that was being picked at and you had some infection that got into the bloodstream, well, technically it could travel up here from the facial vein to the cavernous sinus. You could also have a scalp infection that goes through the superior sagittal sinus, which we'll talk about on this slide, and reach the cavernous sinus through emissary veins. And you could also go from the teeth that would drain into the pterygoid plexus and then also get to the cavernous sinus. So those are three distinct routes that can lead to infection and cavernous sinus thrombosis. So the superior sagittal sinus refers to the space between the two layers of the dura mater. So the dura mater often splits to form venous channels that drain blood directly from the brain. And this, again, has no valves and has a lot of anastomoses, a lot of connections that allows blood to flow in any direction. And unfortunately, that does have some benefits, but it also has some negative effects that it can transport metastases and spread infections like we just talked about. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting me and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for all of their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on them and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.